Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third session of uh, uh, our webinar series, uh, which is uh, uh, going to be presented by Dr. Elliot Block today on uh, uh, success of transition and how prepartum uh, management intersects with postpartum health and production. Uh, Again, I want to uh, emphasize that how Arm and Hammer is committed uh, towards the uh, education of uh, its customers and uh, keep them up to date, not only on the product, but uh, latest research going on in the industry. So I'm so glad to introduce today uh, to the group, Dr. Elliot Block, who is a famous scientist and behind uh, many projects which he has given to the world dairy industry, including uh, including DCAT uh, balancing programs, uh, concept of bypass uh, uh, fats, and so many other uh, research uh, in his name. Uh, Dr. Elliot Block used to uh, uh, used to be a, a renowned professor in Canada uh, for quite a long time, and he has so many uh, PhD and graduates uh, uh, under him, which, which he has uh, guided. And then uh, he joined Armin Hammer and uh, now working as a, a director and research fellow for uh, research and development wing of Armin Hammer. Um, he is uh, working for Armin Hammer for almost 20 years. Uh, and whenever you, you, you browse uh, decad balancing or something uh, related to this topic, you'll, you'll get a lot of research paper uh, by the name of Dr. Elliot Block. So, we are fortunate uh, that we have him uh, today uh, in, in our webinar. And uh, without wasting much of uh, our time, I would just like to hand over the session to Dr. Elliot Block. Dr. Block, uh, welcome. You can start, please. Thank you, Rajit. Um, just a few housekeeping things. There's, you're all gonna be muted. So there is a Q and A button that if you push that and you, you have any questions, we'll, we'll amass them during the presentation and then address as many as we can at the end. Um, if there are any that are unanswered because we run out of time, we'll contact you by email. We'll know who, who gave us the question. Uh, and this, this session is being recorded uh, for your information. Okay, so we're going to start um, on this topic of transition, uh, prepartum management, how it really helps with health reproduction and production after, after calving. Oh, the slides aren't moving. Here we go. So everybody should understand that this prepartum transition period really sets the stage uh, for health and production after calving. It, it's don't have any great expectations during the period that you're feeding. And understand that this period here uh, that we call the transition period, which encompasses both three weeks prepartum, three weeks postpartum uh, are probably the most crucial phase because once a cow goes beyond about 190 or 100 days in milk and she's successfully bred, there's very little you can do to affect the production that occurs, uh, I mean, other than, you know, bad nutrition or, bad, or health issues, you're really not going to affect what goes on for the next 200 and some odd days. So what if you can focus on those most important jobs? And we had done a survey um, of producers, a pretty extensive survey questionnaire done by a third party. And what they came up with was that these were the six most important jobs that people are working on if they have enough resources to do them. That it not only includes labor and time, uh, but also assistance. 
And what was interesting is that none of the producers had said that milk yield is their most important job. Because what they realize is that if they have the health, the reproduction, cow comfort, ration balancing, if all of those things are in line, the cows will produce the milk. They don't, uh, they don't need to tell the cow to just focus on milk production. Now, one question that always comes up is this issue of high production. You'll hear people say, oh, I don't want my cows to produce too much milk because that's what causes my health and reproduction issues. And really, this is just one of several studies. But what I want to point out is that if we take a look at reproduction cyclicity, okay, and we take a look at the body condition score changed from calving to 65 days in milk. So in other words, are they losing weight? Are they maintaining weight? Or uh, I'm sorry, are they losing weight, a lot of weight, a little bit of weight, or no change in body condition score? And what you see for cyclicity is that the cows that lost body weight had the lowest level of cyclicity and the ones that lost minimum amount or no change in body weight had excellent cyclicity. If we take a look at milk yield and its relationship to cyclicity, this is for 32 up to 50 kilograms a day, what do you see? You see no difference in cyclicity. So while energy balance is critical to animals coming back into heat, milk yield has no relationship. And then if we look at pregnancy, we see the same thing. If we look at the percent of animals that are pregnant, the ones that had no change in body condition or minimal change in body condition had higher success with pregnancies versus those that lost body weight. But when we look at it in terms of milk production, again, from 32 to 50 kilos, no difference. So milk production is not the reason that animals don't reproduce. It's managing their body condition or energy balance. Uh, so it has more to do with the ration and how, how well that ration meets production needs than it does for anything else. Now, what I'm showing you here is a study. It, it's actually a very nice study that was uh, done a few years ago, actually last year. Um, it was 18, almost 19,000 Holstein cows in two herds over three years. And what they looked at is irrespective of anything else, how many days were the animals in the prepartum group? And it goes from zero days up to 45 days versus morbidity. So that's disease, just total disease. The white circles are primiparous cows, the first lactation, and the black lines are, are circles are, are paris cows, so second, third, fourth lactation. And what you see is that for the primiparous cows, the first calving, not much of a difference. And by the way, this is mostly metritis um, in these first calf heifers. So you don't see a big change with the number of days in the prepartum group. But for cows, what you see is the cows that spent somewhere between 20 and 25 days in the prepartum group had the lowest incidence of morbidity and the highest milk yield, postpartum. Okay, primiparous cows, you see a similar trend uh, not as strong, obviously, as, as the Paris cows, but the same trend. 
So number of days in the close-up pen, irrespective of anything else, seems to have a significant impact on health, postpartum health and postpartum production. So when do cows actually get sick? Here is a graph of the number of cows that were in the study. Uh, I'm sorry, 753 cows. It was on three farms, New York, Ohio, and California. And we're looking at days postpartum and the incidence of metritis. Now, obviously, metritis is going to happen early on. But we see that most of the cases are really in the first week, and almost all of them in the first two weeks postpartum, and then virtually nothing. If we look at cows that are sick with disease that are non-uterine in nature, this was a second study uh, of 1,100, almost 1,200 cows. We see that all of those non-uterine diseases, so we've taken out metritis, uh, so this is probably ketosis, milk fever, displacements, all of those issues. They're all occurring in the first three weeks postpartum. So if prepartum feeding prevents any level of these diseases in the first three weeks postpartum, you have done a lot to your pocketbook both in milk production and cost of fighting the diseases. 78% of the first diagnosed diseases occur in the first three weeks postpartum. So that's where you should focus. Now, this is sort of a rhetorical question. Why is disease incidence uh, so high in these early lactation cows? Some of it is not really nutrition. If you take a look at the top three pictures versus the bottom two pictures, I don't think I have to say much about why those cows in the top photos uh, are suffering. These are cows, pictures taken of cows in the post fresh group, so immediately postpartum. You see their housing, you see what they're lying in, you see their, uh, their exposure. Um, I don't know how you can't think that these cows are not going to get ill or that their risk for sickness is, is higher versus the cows in the bottom two photos, which are bedded nicely in their stalls, completely in their stalls. Uh, you see that they like the stalls uh, because they're lying down. The cows in the top three photos, and we'll discuss this a little bit more, are definitely under stress. And what does stress cause? Stress causes inflammation. Whether it's a, expressed as a fever or a higher heart rate, whatever it is, that stress causing inf inflammation is going to waste energy because energy has to be diverted to their immune system in order to keep those cows on their feet. Are the transition pens underpopulated, overpopulated? The photo on the right is an example of overpopulation. Animals are fighting to get to the feed bunk. Somebody is going to suffer. And the one that's suffering in this case, I don't know if it's the one on top or the one on bottom, but one of them or both of them are suffering. They don't have access to the feed bunk. Versus the photo on the left, which may be an extreme of underpopulation, but we always try to get, especially these transition pens, underpopulated so that animals have free access to feed, to water, to, to stalls. Um, they don't have inflammation. They don't have as much stress on their system. So the take home message is 
from this section is basically to avoid excess body condition loss. Uh, you shouldn't, you should not be losing more than a half of a condition point uh, between the, the week before calving to the first artificial insemination. So in other words, you've got five or six weeks there that you should not be losing more than a half a condition point. And we don't usually have too much of this problem uh, on this side of the world, but over conditioning of cows and heifers is definitely not a good thing. You wind up with fatty livers, you wind up with low dry matter intakes uh, and a whole host of other diseases. So let me give you an example. And this one is a little bit difficult to grasp when we uh, take a look at the results. But this is examples of two, two conditions that induce inflammatory responses. One is obvious, the one on the right, you have metritis. The one on the left is heat stress. And heat stress is just as detrimental as any infectious disease. So let me explain this this study. It's a little difficult, but it's the first one really that gets at nutrients that are being used when an animal is not feeling too well. So these were groups of animals. Uh, in this case, it was beef steers um, because they're easy to, uh, to cannulate and to get all the samples we need. And what we're looking at here, are these steers that were cannulated uh, in their mesenteric arteries and veins, in their hepatic portal uh, drainage system, uh, so that we can take samples of all the nutrients that are going into the liver and coming out of the liver. Half of the animals were challenged with hemolytica. So we were giving them uh, an infection in order to cause a stress. And what we did was look at nutrient, in this case, amino acids, amino acid flux. What does amino acid flux mean? We're looking at the amino acids that are entering the liver and those that are leaving the liver. Okay, a flux of zero means that just as many came into the liver as left the liver. A negative flux means that less came out of the liver than went into the liver, so the liver is using them. And a positive flux means that the liver is actually sending more amino acids out of the liver than it's receiving. So if we look at this and we look at essential amino acids, we see that the animals that were ill that had this challenge, their livers were using far more essential amino acids than the animals that were not challenged. Now we expect the liver to be using the essential amino acids. It has to make protein. Uh, it's certainly not producing essential amino acids. That's why they're essential. Uh, so the negative flux here for the control animals is normal. The increase in, in the negativity of that flux, the increase of use of essential amino acids is basically being used by the animal to overcome uh, some of the health challenges that it has. If we look at the non-essential amino acids, these are the ones that can be produced by the liver. You see that in the control group, they were producing non-essential amino acids, but the challenge group was still using more non-essential amino acids than it was receiving and it had a negative flux. And when we look at it in total, the livers of the control animals were producing a net increase in amino acid output. The challenged animals were using, their livers were using an excess of amino acids. The difference here, if we calculate the difference in moles per day and convert it to grams, 
that's 380 grams of amino acids. That's metabolizable amino acids for a 400 kilogram steer. Now we didn't do this for dairy, but we used some calculations. Um, and if this were the same case in the dairy cow, that would be equivalent to the true protein in eight kilos of milk. Now it probably will not be eight kilos of milk, but because this is a calculation, uh, but realize that this 380 grams of amino acids is huge in comparison to the total amino acids that this cow is eating, this uh, steer is, is consuming. Unfortunately, uh, we can't do it yet for energy. We don't have the research data for energy, but you know, it, it logically should, in, should understand that if you increase the metabolic rate of an animal, you're increasing energy wastage that's not being able to be used for productive purposes. So what is the impact of uterine disease on reproduction? I don't, th I think most of you would understand this quite easily. Animals without uterine disease, uh, we have a pregnancy per embryo transfer here and a 21 day pregnancy rate that's much higher than animals that have had uterine disease. Their service rates are significantly lower with uterine disease as is their pregnancies and the 21 day pregnancy rate. And that translate into the percentage of animals that are pregnant. You see an important difference here for animals that had uterine disease versus those that did not have uterine disease uh, for the animals that are, the proportion of animals that are pregnant uh, in the herd. Actually, th this graph is animals that are not pregnant. So you see that the, the pregnancy, the non-pregnancies decrease very fast. And by 100 days in milk, in the, this group, you have 40% uh, you have pregnant, I'm sorry, 40% not pregnant by 100 days in milk versus 60% not pregnant for those animals that had uterine disease. So one of the transition issues, and Dr. Ruby Wu had done this last week with you, so I'll go through it very quickly, was the subject of DCAD balancing. And basically that if you have a negative DCAD, you reduce blood buffers and create a mild acidosis. If you have a positive DCAD, you increase blood buffers. It's just completely the opposite. And the DCAD is simply the uh, difference between the cations, sodium and potassium, minus the anions, chloride and sulfur. She showed you that there are strong relationships between blood pH and DCAD. And let me define DCAD here as far as how, what number we use. There are two different numbers that people use sometimes. DCAD expressed per 100 grams of dry matter. Sometimes it's expressed per kilogram of dry matter. And it's just a difference of uh, another decimal. So this minus 10 is per 100 grams of dry matter. If you saw minus 100, it's per kilogram of dry matter. So what you see is that as DCAD goes down, you reduce blood buffering capacity. It's pretty strong. You see blood bicarbonate has a very strong relationship. The more negative the DCAD, uh, the lower is the blood bicarbonate. And we measure, we use urine pH as an indication of whether or not we've induced this metabolic acidosis uh, because it's a very, there's a very strong relationship between DCAD as it goes down, so does urine pH. Now, notice it's not a perfect line, right? So you can have cows that are at minus 10 uh, or minus 100 that have a urine pH of in the, in the low five range and those that are in the six range. 
So there are other factors that influence urine pH, uh, but DCAD is more than 50% of the reason for blood, for urine pH being uh, increasing or decreasing. The original reason for negative DCAD was to prevent this, which is hypocalcemia. Cows that have milk fever have a very sharp drop in blood calcium at calving, but by about one or two days after calving, they come back, assuming that they survive. But this decrease, this milk fever causes a loss of production, causes an increase in diseases like uh, retained placentas, metritis, um, and displacements. And we see that as you decrease DCAD, when you go from say a plus 10 to a minus 10, that the blood calcium at calving is higher. Now this sort of mimics that graph that I showed you up front, that irrespective of anything else, number of days in the close-up pen impacts postpartum milk production and disease. Now, in this case, this is a similar graph that was done on a number of uh, three herds. This was in Australia. And what we're looking at is the number of days in the prepartum transition pen versus postpartum fat corrected milk yield. All of these cows received, in this case, BioClor, which that was the product used to create the negative DCAD. And we see a very similar trend as we did in that graph I showed you up front. That as you increase the number of days in the transition pen for cows that are being fed this negative DCAD, you get increases in milk yield up to about 21 days, and then it flattens out. Some would argue that once you get out here to 42 days, uh, you start seeing a trend going downward. Uh, but certainly between 21 and 35 or 40 days, it's pretty much a flat line. This translates into more cows in calf. And again, if we look at proportion of the cows that are pregnant, so zero, 20%, 40%, 60% versus days to conception, for cows that were fed in the blue line, the transition diet with BioClor for 20 days or more, and those that were fed in the black line fewer than 20 days, but more than 10 days, and then those that were fed less than 10 days, you see a significant increase in animals that were pregnant by any, any point postpartum. And finally, by 100 days, you have 8% cows more cows in calf if they were fed the BioClor diet for 20 days or more. This one kind of surprised me. I wasn't expecting the, uh, the convergence of the cows that were 11 days or less or 10 days or less to be very so close. But what we're looking at here, the proportion of cows that were removed from the herd. So culling rate. 2%, 4%, and when they were removed from the herd. And what you see is that for cows that were fed the BioClor for 20 days or more, they had half the removal rate, so about 3% removal rate by 140 days versus about 7% for cows that were fed less than 20 days. And as I indicated in a previous graph, uh, most of the removal rates had occurred very early. So by 60 days in milk, you've lost most of the animals. This of course related into milk yield and that those cows that were fed BioClor for 20 days or more had the highest milk yield uh, of those cows and this translated into about 850 kilograms of milk.
This was one of the first trials we had done. Um, what you see is, what you're looking at actually is milk yield postpartum for the first 21 days postpartum for animals that were fed prepartum, a negative DCAD with BioClor, a negative DCAD with anionic salts versus a positive DCAD. Now all the cows here postpartum are fed the same diet. The difference is what they were fed prepartum. And what you see is that the cow, the first thing that should hit you is the cows fed a negative DCAD, whether it was with BioClor or anionic salts, outproduced the cows that were fed a positive DCAD. The cows fed the BioClor had a higher startup milk and maintained slightly higher milk production, significantly higher than the anionic salt group. Now, I don't believe that that's because there's a difference in the way the DCAT is being administered. To me, a minus 10 or a minus eight is the same whether you're getting it from BioClor or anionic salts. The difference here is that BioClor also gives you a, a level of protein, of metabolizable protein of high quality which is why these cows fed BioClor prepartum started off much higher than either the control group or the anionic salt group. And that increase in startup milk translated into more milk for the whole 21 days. Now, this isn't meant to confuse, this is just a, an example <clears throat> we had run this meta-analysis, which is sort of an epidemiological study of all the studies that had looked at DCAT. And I just chose one parameter to look at here in detail. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you in the next slides a summary of what was found. So what a meta-analysis does is it takes a look at all of these trials that fit into this analysis. These are all individual studies. And what we're looking at here is the result of DCAD on retained placentas. Each individual study is evaluated by size. And this gray box indicates how many cows, it gives you an idea of what the size of the study was. So this study here that I'm pointing at was a very small study. And these studies at the bottom here were much larger studies as far as number of cows. The horizontal line, the black line is simply an indication of the variance, the variation around the diamond, the black diamond, which is the actual point estimate. That's the, for the lack of a better word, it's the average. The solid black line going up and down is basically zero, no response. Anything to the left of that line means that you reduced retained placenta, and anything to the right of that line means that you increase retained placenta. And what we see overall is that the estimate for cows, postpartum cows, is that negative DCAD reduced retained placentas, and for heifers as well. For the first calf heifers, it reduced retained placentas. So everything is weighted here. It's not a simple average. You can't take a study with 20 cows and take the result and average it with a study for 100 cows. Uh, so this type of analysis weights the study based on the size and the variation. And then what we do is we look for a breakpoint. And in this case, I chose urine pH and risk of milk fever uh, because it's the easiest one to show. What you see is that as urine pH drops, as your indication of acidosis, your risk of milk fever goes down. So then what we do is we take a look to see where a step change occurs. In other words, where is the break point of this line that tells you uh, you've done your job? 
good enough. And in this case, the significant step change occurred between urine pH 6.4 to 6.6. .6. What that means is that getting a urine pH less than 6.4 doesn't really improve your response. And getting a urine pH above 6.4 is where you start seeing uh, increased risk of milk fever. Until you get way out here, at pH eight, where you have a very high ins a very high risk of milk fever. So we did this breakpoint for all of the parameters that were measured, uh, and what we see is that you don't need to have an extremely negative decad in order to get a response to get your desired response. These parameters here reduced prepartum feed intake, increased postpartum intake, increased calcium at calving, increased milk, reduced metritis, reduced overall disease events, and reduced clinical milk fever. Those were all the parameters that were significantly impacted uh, by feeding this negative decad prepartum. And where that break point was, it wasn't a very, it wasn't an exact one, but you see that you don't see anybody at minus 12 or minus 16 or minus 18, uh, or in terms per kilogram of dry matter intake, minus 120, minus 180. What you see is that the range is somewhere between six and 10, minus six to minus 10. And in some cases, it's even less than minus six. It's less negative for milk production the breakpoint is somewhere between minus five to minus eight. So you don't need a very strong acidosis in order to get these responses. And in fact, if you do go too negative, you will wind up with a reduction in prepartum feed intake. Now, going back to energy balance and how important that is, you don't want to increase, to reduce prepartum dry matter intake if at all it can be avoided. You can account for it, but you would have to have a more dense prepartum ration, which means it would be more expensive. You need more protein, you need more energy per kilogram of dry matter uh, if you're reducing prepartum feed intake. And to illustrate this, the question comes up, does dry matter intake decrease prepartum because of, in this case, biochlor or because of the acidosis? And I'll give you the result is basically that it's the acidosis. And if you do the acidosis too strongly, you will reduce feed intake. So here we have a diet that had nothing particularly special, prepartum diet a decad of plus 20 or plus 200, dry matter intake of 10 and a half kilos a day and a urine pH of 8.2. Pretty typical if you don't do anything about decad. Now go over to the left side and here we have the BioClor diet where it was formulated for minus 110, minus 120. Uh, dry matter intake went down by a little more than a kilo and urine pH was 5.6. So we lost a kilo, a little more than a kilo of dry matter intake by feeding this minus 114. If we take that same diet and just increase the decad by adding sodium bicarbonate and potassium carbonate, so same amount of biochlor, but we increase sodium and potassium, we brought the decad back up to control levels, about a plus 20. Dry matter intake went back up to 10 and a half and urine pH was at 7.9. So the conclusion here is that biochlor itself is not really reducing feed intake. It's this negative decad that's doing it. And what our breakpoint analysis said was that if you have a decad of minus 60 to minus 90, you're not going to see that reduction in dry matter intake.
some of the other results. This was all from that meta-analysis. So all of these studies that I showed you that were listed on the left-hand side of the page, those are in these graphs. Here we have milk yield and dry matter intake postpartum with the DCAD level that was fed during those trials. And what you see is that milk yield for Paris cows, for multi-Paris cows, uh, is higher postpartum when the DCAD prepartum was low. For heifers, it didn't seem to matter. They didn't seem to respond in milk yield. If we look at dry matter intake postpartum, again, for multi-Paris cows, you see higher postpartum feed intake when DCAD was negative prepartum. For heifers, there was no significant effect. The risk of milk fever was obvious. Lower DCAD, DCAD's below the zero. You see reduction in the risk of milk fever. Above zero, you start seeing an increase in the risk of milk fever. And the one that intrigued me the most was this total disease events per cow. And what we see is the cows that were fed the negative DCAD prepartum had the lowest postpartum uh, disease events, total disease events, uh, compared to the cows that were fed positive DCAD. For heifers, this relationship was even stronger. So even though they didn't seem to respond in milk or feed intake to negative DCAD, they did respond with fewer postpartum diseases. And those postpartum diseases were primarily uh, retained placentas and metritis. So what you see here is that the Paris cows had lower incidence of retained placentas when they were fed negative DCAD prepartum. The heifers, that was extremely strong and it looked like almost a straight line. And while cows, they had a significant reduction in um, metritis to feeding negative DCAD, but it wasn't as strong a relationship as it was with heifers. So most of these diseases in the heifers have to do with metritis and retained placentas. So when we took those meta-analyses and we put them into a model to see what DCAD would do if all of, when all of these cows were fed uh, a DCAD of minus 100 versus plus 200 or plus 20 versus minus 10, what we see is that you get an increase of a kilo, a little more than a kilo in postpartum dry matter intake per day, an increase in milk of 1.7 kilos, fat corrected milk of 1.2 kilos, and that alone would probably more than pay for the biochlor addition that you're using. On top of that, you get an 80% reduction in milk fever, 47% reduction in retained placentas, 40% reduction in nitritis, and a 56% reduction in total diseases per cow. And you can add up the cost of those diseases and that basically is your profit. I didn't say displaced abomasums because this minus 18% was not significant. It was not a significant number. So I'll move off of DCAD now and go to this resiliency issue. What we're talking about with resiliency is basically how well the cow can respond to challenges. And these are usually immune challenges. Ben Saylor had spoken to you about poor feed hygiene and how that impacts your pathogen control in the animal. He also spoke about optimal rumen function and poor feed hygiene and how that impacts rumen function without the animal necessarily being visibly ill. 
And then the issue of hindgut health. In other words, how is the intestine reacting to all of these challenges? So we use this product called Salmonax, and I just want to give you, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with it, what Salmonax is. Salmonax SCP, which SCP stands for Soluble Concentrated Powder, uh, it's manufactured using yeast as a raw material. It's not yeast. It uses all of the ingredients that yeast has, and then we manufacture a product that we call Selmanax. Has about 40% protein, but I wouldn't count on it as a protein supplement because you're adding very small amounts. Um, three grams per cow is not really going to impact your protein level of the ration. But what it contains are these carbohydrates, simple and complex carbohydrates that we actually enzymatically hydrolyze. We have a proprietary three-stage enzymatically enzymatic hydrolysis process that breaks down these long chain polymers of mannose, as monin oligosaccharides or moss, and beta-glucans that are not digested by the animal. And we break them down into smaller, more bioactive molecules. Uh, so this is a proprietary process. Uh, and we believe that that's what creates this high bioactivity for Selmanax. So what Selmanax actually is, is a combination of yeast culture. So we do make a yeast culture. Uh, we sell it separately, it's called Amax. And it's a yeast culture like, pretty much like any other yeast culture. And then we enzymatically hydrolyze the yeast cells and we dry it on a drum dryer. And we use this term for these hydrolyzed cells that we call refined functional carbohydrates. They're not digested and absorbed by the animal, but they have a function in the gastrointestinal tract. And without showing you all the studies, I can show you any of these studies if, if you want them, I can give them to you, they're publications. Um, we've seen antibody responses to vaccines that were better for animals fed Selmanax. Um, you know, most vaccines that you give an animal, uh, they, they're usually good vaccines. They usually work. And when they fail to produce an antibody titer that's high enough, people tend to blame the vaccine. It's not the vaccine. It's usually that the animals are having an immune challenge of another nature. Maybe it's a hindgut challenge, maybe it's a mycotoxin challenge uh, that prevents the antibodies from uh, responding. And giving Selmanax improves this. It also improves neutrophil activity and the ability to for these neutrophils to actually engulf uh, or phagocytize pathogens. We've seen, and I'll show you some of the data, a reduction in inflammatory cytokines and a lower co cortisol response when the animals are stressed uh, in addition to a reduced fever response, you know, body fever. And why is that important? When we want to have inflammatory responses, we need inflammation to fight things off. But when the animal has a hyper response, that's wasting energy because inflammation uses energy, whether it's to create a fever or whether it's to fight different diseases, uh, different pathogens, you're using energy that could be used for productive purposes. We've seen a reduction in, um, in organs, specifically in the mammary gland, uh, to inflammation. So this is for clinical, not, not environmental, but clinical mastitis. And we've seen a reduction in cryptospore, crypto, salmonella, E. coli, and other, some viruses shedding from calves. Now, 
I don't want anybody to think that Selmanax has any direct effect on viruses because it doesn't, it shouldn't. However, if we improve the immune system of the animal, the animal will be able to fight these viruses uh, more appropriately uh, than if the immune system is suppressed. So what Selmanax does, and specifically what our refined functional carbohydrates do, is as D-mannose, not as mannan oligosaccharide, not as that long chain, but as smaller units, it's able to bind, irreversibly bind to various bacteria that have a specific characteristic. And that is that they have these finger-like projections on them. These pili are what bind to the intestinal cell wall uh, and colonize. They also can bind to mannose. So what is happening is that we bind these bugs to the mannose, to the short units of mannan oligosaccharide, and then they no longer can bind to the intestinal cell wall. And we wind up with a lower degree of infection of the intestinal cell wall. This is an example of what we call cytotoxicity. And this one is to, to illustrate the protection of these, that these RFCs afford the intestine uh, against mycotoxins. This is in a lab, uh, but I'll show you some in vivo data as well. This is just to give you an example. What we do is, is we grow an intestinal cell line, and this is a bovine cell line in a Petri dish. So if this Petri dish is full, wall to wall, or circle to circle, uh, of intestinal cell walls. We put in a specific dye, and if the cells maintain that dye after it's washed, it means that they're all viable. Okay, so these are all healthy cells. When we take that same Petri dish and we expose it to, in this case, fumonisin, you see a lot of clear areas. That indicates the cells are dead. And in this case, these cells are only naturally protected, protecting themselves to about a 28% level. So 82% of the cells died. If we take this same experiment, but have the RFCs or have Selmanax in with these cells, what we see is 98% protection. So somehow these cells are being protected from the effects of humanosin by the Selmanax. Now, some people would say, oh, that, that's binding. I don't believe that's binding. And the reason I say that is because of these experiments here. We know, for example, that Don or vomitoxin is not bound very well by any, any mycotoxin binder. However, if we take a look at the cytotoxicity scores, uh, three being everyone's dead and zero being everyone's alive, we see that with the RFCs, with Selmanax, we protect these cells against cytotoxicity, whereas without, they all die. And we've done this with intestinal cell walls of a bovine cell line and intestinal cell walls of a porcine cell line, uh, just to show that it's really not species specific. We, we get protection in either case. So this is something different than just binding a mycotoxin. And here was a comparison that was done. This was done by, in fact, all of these studies were done by a researcher at Agriculture and Food Canada, 
uh, so the, the research station in Lethbridge, Alberta. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and what we see is that against these three mycotoxins, aflatoxin, fumonisin, and T2, Selmanax protected these cells against damage, whereas these other products did not. This was not a binding experiment. This was protecting the cells. So we see that something like safmanin or integral do afford some level of protection. And they should because they are based on yeast cell walls, uh, but they're not hydrolyzed. So let's see what these mycotoxins or any other pathogen can do to uh, an animal. And I think this is kind of a repeat of what Ben Saylor had presented. What you're looking at on the left side is a healthy intestine and the right side is not so much healthy. The intestinal cell wall is protected by this thick mucin layer. And there's two different subunits of that, but basically everything in yellow here is the mucin cell layer. All of these purple cell, all of these purple uh, cells are what we call commensal organisms. They are the normal, the good bacteria that inhabit the intestinal lining. And what they do is protect against pathogen invasion simply by overpowering and having so many of these bugs here, they are competitively excluding these pathogens from getting access. Then you have the intestinal cell itself, which have these, you see the abbreviation AMP, which is an antimicrobial peptide. So these cells actually produce antimicrobials uh, to help prevent these pathogens from gaining access. And they will secrete them into this lower level of the mucin uh, to prevent these bugs from getting access. If a pathogen does get in, it can kill an intestinal cell, but then you have a reasonable immune system that's working that can take care of it. If we take a look at the right-hand side, and you do anything to deplete this mucin layer, and by virtue of that, you're reducing the number of microbial organisms. And sometimes you'll see animals that have diarrhea and you'll see what we call mu mucin casts. It looks like a whole big wad of mucus that's in the fecal matter. That's the animal shedding this mucin layer. So it's depleting the mucin layer. You'll see it primarily in calves, but you'll see it in cows as well. And when you deplete that layer, you then have less of these good bacteria. You have greater access to the intestinal cell wall uh, from pathogens. They start killing intestinal cells, either directly or by squeezing through in between two cells. Okay, and once that happens, then you have a systemic infection. And you still have this immune system functioning, but you're, you're being overwhelmed by the number of pathogens that are entering the system. So what depletes this mucin layer? Any stress, and I mean any stress we get a depleted mucin layer if the animals are deprived of feed and water for as little as four hours. We get a depletion of the mucin layer when an animal is under heat stress. Uh, so it's not just a pathogen that can cause the depletion. You could have a low level of pathogens, but deprive the animal of feed and water or put the animal under heat stress, and then you get pathogen invasion. And obviously, if you, if you do anything, we call this leaky gut. The, the gut is leaking these, what's outside 
to the inside. You'll get reduced nutrient absorption, reduced digestibility, and reduction of feed efficiency. So why is this important? I'm gonna use two, two examples, pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, and bacterial metritis. How the heck do bugs, pathogens get these, get to the liver, uh, I'm sorry, get to the intestine, uh, the lungs or the uterus? And really there's only one place it can come from and that's the intestine. So these bugs are getting into the intestinal cell wall, being absorbed, going systemic and winding up causing pneumonia and causing metritis. This is a, a picture, a cartoon of what's called the tight cell junctions. These are the junctions that are in between two cells within the intestine. And it's a series of proteins that essentially glue these cells together so that they do, do not allow pathogen entry. What stress does is it weakens these junctions and then the bugs creep through. So you don't have to necessarily kill an intestinal cell to get a pathogen to enter the bloodstream. And where's the first place it goes? It goes to the liver. So it goes to the liver, and this is also the cause of liver abscesses. Uh, we don't see them very much in dairy cattle because we don't kill them too often. Um, when they're autopsied, you will find them. It is a case for beef cattle for sheep, for goats, where you will get liver abscesses, uh, but more so you can always condemn the liver and not use it, but it is what sets up the animal for pneumonia and metritis. Now, if we take a look at the efficacy um, of products to prevent the attachment of salmonella to bovine epithelial cells. I'm gonna use this one product as an example, um, Safmanan versus, or Safman versus Selmanax. And what we see here is the adherence inhibition. So in this case, at 0.01% concentration, Selmanax inhibited about 32% uh, attachment of, of these back, yeah, of the salmonella to the intestinal cell walls in culture. The safmanin also inhibited, but only to about 6%. It's not until you get to a concentration 10 times that of 0.1% versus 0.01% that the safmanin was able to inhibit to the same level as the Selmanax did at the 0.01% concentration. So why I show you this is not so much to compare the two products, is to show you that even though you have products of similar composition, the bioactivity is very different. And you should not use something like percent mannose or percent beta glucans or something like that as an indication of whether or not the product works. A product like Biomoss, which is all yeast cell walls, doesn't really bind very many bugs. Yet it has more moss, more man and oligosaccharides than Selmanax has. But Selmanax binds significantly more. So it's the activity of these molecules that's more important than how much is there. Here's an example in calves. And now this was a calf ranch, 3,500 calves that we put into two groups, either fed control or fed Selmanax. Uh, these calves were healthy. There was very low morbidity, very low mortality. What we looked at was 
first of all, total E. coli. And we don't see any differences in the first seven days. Uh, and that's where you have your highest shedding of these pathogens. First seven days uh, or the next or the first 21 days. But by 42 days of age, towards the end of the weaning phase, we do see a significant reduction in E. coli and pathogenic E. coli. Fairly large reduction. Don't forget this is on a log scale. So small change in the bar is a large change in numbers. When we look at crypto shedding, a little word about cryptosporidium. You want the animals to get crypto. You want the animals to get coxy, coccidiosis, uh, because that's what that's what causes their immune system to kick into gear. And then as adult animals, they're resistant to both of these organisms. What you don't want to happen is what happened here at day 14. And that is that the control animals had a huge increase in shedding. So here you have shedding of about 120,000 oocysts per gram. And here you have about 1.2 million shedding. That's what we call the outbreak. And the animals that have that outbreak should show some effect on production performance um, that's different from the Selmanax animals. So the shedding is normal. This hyper shedding means that you have a very large infection. And we do see a difference in overall body weight gain in grams per day. Uh, this was not significant. This was a trend overall. Uh, no difference in the early phase, but we see a large difference in the late phase uh, where the animals fed the Selmanax have a greater weight gain. We're assuming that this is because of the reduction in the outbreak of crypto. Maybe more important to that, if we take a look at these animals were followed back to their herds, nothing was done to them, particularly from the time they were weaned till the time they calved. Uh, and we took a look at their production performance in their first lactation. And what we see is those animals that were fed Selmanax in the first 56 days of life, nothing after that, produced 195 kilos more milk, 13 more kilos of fat and eight kilos more protein than animals that were not fed Selmanax. So these effects that you have in the early phase in that calf re rearing phase have profound impact on production performance after, after their first calving. If we take a look at all of the studies that we've done, um, for immune support using Selmanax. Again, I can show you these studies. This is where they were published. Uh, interferon gamma was lower, haptoglobin lower, interleukin-8 was lower, and serum cortisol was lower in receiving beef animals. And our ability to increase phagocytosis in transition cows and a reduction in interleukin-6, which is related to metritis, were higher for the phagocytosis, lower for the interleukin-8 in transition cows. This is an example of a receiving trial. It's a beef receiving trial, but nonetheless, uh, still a ruminant. What we're looking at is their serum cortisol over the 60 day feeding trial. And you see cortisol was higher when animals were not fed Selmanax. Then what we did is we put them on a truck and transported them around for 24 hours and brought them back. So that was the stress. We see that the cortisol remained higher in the control animals, lower in the Selmanax animals. And when we tested their response to cortical-releasing hormone, 
the animals that were not fed Selmanax had a greater response. Uh, this would be considered a hyper response in corticotropic releasing hormone uh, versus the Selmanax animals. So they're still responding to stress, but to a lower level. And when we look at their inflammatory cytokines, so we looked at two inflammatory cytokines during the 60 day trial. We see that at the beginning, they were both about the same. By 15 days, we've reduced the inflammation, which maintained there through 30, 45, and 60 days of the trial. Same thing for haptoglobin, which is another marker of inflammation. And during that stress, after the transport stress, where we measured their blood cytokines for the first 24 hours, we see that upon arrival, the animals fed the Selmanax had a lower level of inflammation and that remained the same for four, eight, 12, and 24 hours post-transport stress. So the take-home messages here is you want to minimize diseases, both clinical and subclinical. Diseases causes inflammation and tissue damage, which alters function. It alters the partition of nutrients to favor the control animal, uh, the control of infection and tissue repair. So you want to try to make sure that these nutrients, whether it's energy, protein, vitamins, minerals, are going for productive functions, whether that's growth, reproduction, or milk production, rather than going to repairing tissues, uh, rather than creating a fever in the animal. Uh, the priority shifts from production to survival when the animals have disease or inflammation and can create long-term negative effects on productivity. Once you've taken a dairy cow and you've reduced your milk production in that early phase, you may be able to stop the decline, but you're never gonna get that milk back. So heat stress, for example, you can mitigate the effect of heat stress on milk production, but you're never gonna get the milk production back that you lost. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, and I see that there's a whole bunch of questions out there that I hope Ajit's able to ask me. Thank you, Dr. Elliot Block. Very informative and nice presentation. Though we have limited time and there are a lot of questions, so we'll try to cover as much as possible. And uh, whoever is uh, the questions we are not able to take, then we'll come back with the email and one of reply. So a few of the questions are common. So I would like to reply like, uh, uh, once all the four uh, seminar series are uh, finished, then uh, we are going to send the recording links uh, as well as uh, the certificates and presentations. So oh, when and I... I'll put together a, a, a PDF of these slides and we can yeah. send them out to those that request. Yeah, yeah. Once once we have all, all of them, so uh, it'll go automatically to, to all the attendees. So many, many people are asking this. Uh, the next question, Dr. Block, for you is, uh, uh, is it sufficient to balance methionine and lysine for dairy animals if animal is producing 8 kg to 10 kg per day or it is required to some supplement additional amino acids also? I assume we're talking about a cow. Yeah, a cow. Sheep or cow. <laughs> yeah, low producing cow, you can say. Or in India, it is quite common, 8 to 10 kg milk production. I do not think so. A cow should be able to, well, again, first of all, I have to ask why she's making eight to 10 kilos. Um, you know, is, is this a breed? Is this a genetic thing? Or is it a, a, a ration balancing uh, problem? But at eight to 10 kilos, they should not need additional methionine or lysine. Their rumen bacteria should be making enough. 
Now, if you have a functional rumen, they're making enough. If you don't have a functional rumen, then obviously you're going to need something, but I would investigate why, uh, what, what's the limiting factor that you have at most 10 kilos a day? But the simple response is no, you don't need amino acids for that level of milk production. Right, thank you. Uh, another question is coming about the uh, negative DCAD. So uh, uh, the question is like, which uh, anionic salt uh, would you prefer to use uh, to balance negative DCAD? That's a trick question. It's biochlor, <laughs> but biochlor is not an anionic salt. Uh, if you're using salts, um, you have to be careful because you can't, if you start adding more than like 300 milli equivalents of chloride and sulfur, you're going to significantly impair feed intake. Um, but combinations of uh, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, magnesium sulfate, calcium sulfate, you can use, if you can get it, ammonium chloride. I know it's in short supply right now. Um, I prefer not to use ammonium sulfate, although some people use some of that. Uh, but those are the primary salts. You, you're, you, you want to use chloride and sulfate salts without that have no sodium or potassium in them. Sure, thank you. Uh, another question, Dr. Block, is coming about the transition period. Uh, so the question is, what have happened if the transition period they follow 35 days? I think uh, the question is about from 21 days, uh, will it be okay if they consider 35 days or is there any problem in that? Okay, there's, there's disagreement in the literature on this. Um, you don't see any further improvement once you get beyond 21 days, or I'd say 21 to 25 days. The research that we had done, um, well, plus one other researcher, pretty much showed that you can go to 35 days without any issues. Where the disagreement comes in is beyond 35 days. Uh, there are some trials that show that you start getting a reduction in postpartum performance, uh, but still better performance than if you didn't feed a negative DCAD. Okay, so it's, it's not the negative DCAD in question. It's where, where do you optimize postpartum performance? And that's anywhere between 21 and 35 days. Right. Thank you. So I think, uh, uh, on one hand, there is no harm, I think, uh, using till 35 days, except the uh, right. cost. There's no harm. Well, there's actually no harm in 45 days either. I would not feed as strong a negative DCAD. I, I would keep the DCAD down at about minus, minus 60 to minus 70, uh, or minus, six, uh, yeah, minus six to minus seven. Um, and that's just my feeling. Um, you can get a reduction in milk production if you go beyond 35 days, but realize that you're still better off than you would be if you did not feed a negative decad or if you fed it less than 21 days. Right. Uh, so another question is coming from our uh, one of the attendee, but I can't see his name or her name. Uh, the, the question is about a Max and Selman X, and uh, he or she wants to know the difference between uh, between them. Okay, a Max is yeast culture. So the way it's made is that we take yeast, live yeast, we grow it in a fermentation vat, we give it all the nutrients it needs. We grow it until it exhausts all the nutrients and then we kill all the yeast. So there's no live yeast in there. Once this fermentation vat is now full of dead yeast, which includes the yeast cells, all of the nutrients that or byproducts of that fermentation are still in that vat. We take that whole thing and dry it down 
So what we're giving the animal is what we call yeast culture. It's dead yeast, yeast cell walls, uh, the metabolites and byproducts of fermentation, which are thought to affect rumen function directly. Okay, that's most of the research and it doesn't matter whose yeast culture it is, they all show similar responses. What Selmanax is, is different. It is AMAX, so there is yeast culture in there, a full dose of yeast culture, but we've taken additional yeast cell walls and the yeast cell walls that are in AMAX and we've hydrolyzed them to these small bioactive molecules. So Selmanax, if you want to view it that way, is sort of AMAX on steroids. The, the Selmanax also affects the lower gut, whereas AMAX is primarily functioning in the rumen. So what Selmanax gives you is coverage for the rumen and the lower intestine. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Block. And uh, I think uh, that the next question is answered in uh, in first question of uh, Dr. answer of Dr. Block that uh, what is the difference between live yeast and Selmanax. So uh, uh, we are going forward with another question. Uh, this is again regarding uh, uh, Selmanax, STP. So the question is, will this STP cause excessive cellular immunity and waste cause energy? I think it's uh, related to the concentration because of high concentration. Well, SCP, actually what it does is it, it increases your immunity. It doesn't, I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong. It optimizes your immune function. Now, optimizing immune function also implies that we reduce the level of inflammatory response when it goes overboard. So in that study I showed you with the beef animals, with the when we stressed them, they still had inflammatory cytokines, but to a lower level than the animals that were not fed Selmanax. So what we're doing is, is if you want to view it as modulating the immune response, it's not allowing it to go too high it's not allowing it to go too low. Um, so it, it, doesn't it doesn't overstimulate, it doesn't stimulate the immune system. If you want an immunostimulant, then you get into the issues of energy wasting because animals are just doing feudal cycling in creating this uh, energy waste pool. So that's, that's sort of the best way I can describe it. Thank you, Dr. Block. So uh, it's like uh, it's a sort of immune readiness this product creates. Yeah, it's immune so, regulator. Immune readiness prepares the immune system so that the immune system is capable of reacting when it's challenged. Thank you very much. Another question, Dr. Block, uh, uh, since we are running out of time, just a few more minutes and a few questions more I want to cover. Uh, uh, this is again related to the negative DCAD. So what would be the level of a negative DCAD, DCAD recommendation where the ration is 35% of concentrate and around 70% of roughage, uh, like 12 kg of dry matter intake for HF, 600 kg body weight, having 4 kg concentrate, 5 kg corn silage and wheat, brown, etc. Okay, that's uh, the DCAD recommendation doesn't change. So that 12 kilograms of dry matter intake should probably have a DCAD of about minus eight, minus 80. Now, if you're feeding your forage and concentrate separately, I'll use a simple example only because I can't do math that quickly in my head. <laughs> if, if you had 50% concentrate, 50% roughage, and you know the sodium, potassium, chloride, and sulfur, and you calculate your DCAD of that ration, that total ration, if you're feeding the concentrate separately, you would need to have a double concentration of DCAD in that concentrate. So if you're shooting for minus eight, you need a minus 16 in the concentrate so that when you feed it with the roughage, the total ration is minus eight. 
Right. Uh, continuing on this uh, topic only, uh, uh, I have another question from a attendee. Uh, so the question is like, if we use biochlor in close up and fermentin in lactation, and I'm sorry for the other listeners because fermentin was not covered uh, in this in this talk, but uh, it's it's a source of metabolizable protein. So the question, Dr. Block, is uh, if we use biochlor in close up and fermentin in lactation would be more efficient for a high yield cow and uh, do you have any any data for this combination yes i do um first of all fermentin is the same type of protein as biochlor it's just not formulated for the negative decad so fermentin is really for calves heifers and lactating cows that that's where we use it it has a very high level, it, it imparts a high level of metabolizable protein into the ration uh, when it's used. It improves bacterial fermentation, uh, so you get slightly higher fiber digestion and more microbial protein output, which is the best protein for a cow, is microbial. Um, yes, we have data. We have data that shows that you get more uh, metabolizable protein into the cow. We had a pretty big study, Cornell University, where we measured the amount of protein that's leaving the, uh, the rumen and getting to the intestine. We get an increase in that. We get an increase in the, all the essential amino acids that are going out of the rumen. Um, we've improved milk production when compared to soybean meal or heated soybean meal, so bypass protein and, and regular soybean meal. Um, so yes, we have that data. Uh, I could share that with anybody who wants to see that information. Um, it wasn't really the purpose of this presentation to do that, but that's fine. I I'm happy to answer the question. Sure, so maybe... Uh... Uh, we'll note it down and uh, uh, to this particular uh, guest, uh, we'll share that data and research also. So yeah. we are running short of time. Just two more questions, Dr. Block, we will cover and won't take much time from your uh, schedule. Uh, so the second last question is coming. Uh, what is the relationship between total feed intake and protein level of the ration uh, and how you will explain it? Okay, total feed intake has more to do with total balance of the diet rather than protein itself. If I feed excess protein, uh, I will get up to a point, a slight increase in feed intake, but that's not true for metabolizable protein. Once you reach the animal's requirement for metabolizable protein, you're not really going to increase feed intake any further. Um, and that's simply a nitrogen response. That's just, does the animal have enough nitrogen in the rumen, enough nitrogen in the bloodstream? Uh, so that's, that's what that's about. If you feed, let's say, an excessive energy diet, whether you have high or low protein, you're going to get lower feed intake because the animal is going to reach her energy needs and stop eating. Energy is the primary driver for satiety, for feed intake. There is a small effect of protein, but it's not as large as energy. Thank you, Dr. Block, uh, uh, for this explanation. So last uh, question, and uh, I'm, I'm just combining two questions because they're almost similar. So the question is coming, uh, uh, how RFC are able to reduce mycotoxins and can Salmonex replace a mycotoxin binder or mycotoxin product? Okay, that one is pretty easy for me. It's number one, yes, you can replace your mycotoxin binders with Salmonex. We've done that time and time again, whether it's Biomoss or, or, or uh, uh, Omnigen or Safman, Integral, we've replaced them no problem. Now, how it does it, 
there is some binding, okay? But I'm not going to rely on binding to take care of all my mycotoxin problems. Why? Binding is a very finite action. So if I have 100 molecules of a binder, I'm going to bind 100 molecules of maximum of a toxin. Well, what happens to the rest of the toxins? Um, so I don't believe that binding is necessarily uh, the answer. It, it's part of it, but it, it's not the answer. Plus, most of these mycotoxin binders do a pretty good job of binding aflatoxin, but not so much for the other mycotoxins. What I think is happening with the Selmanax, and I tried to indicate in the presentation, is that you're actually imparting uh, an immune function to these cells resisting the mycotoxin damage caused by the mycotoxins. And we saw that in the cell culture, even if we were using vomitoxin, which is not bound by anything very well, protected the cells. So there is a level of immunity and whether that's the tight cell junctions or whether that's improving the mucin layer, I'm not sure because the mycotoxins also get trapped in this mucin layer and then cannot have access to the cell. So I don't know what percentage of things are being done, but I do know that it's those two functions uh, with the binding being minor, but the protection of the cells being the greater uh, for mycotoxin control. Thank you, Dr. Block, for, for nicely explaining this complex uh, uh, mode of action. Uh, so we are coming uh, uh, towards the end of this session. I would like to thank everyone for joining this uh, uh, session and uh, thanks for joining uh, in such a huge number. Uh, and uh, as per our commitment, we continue to, to uh, bring the latest information to our customers. Looking forward to see you all uh, in our next and final session on 29th of this month. Uh, till then, stay safe and uh, thanks again. Take care. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Blog, again. Thank you.